Hey everyone, it's Steve Richard in a first for call camp. I'm doing it from the train. <laughs> good, good thing my colleague Scott from Vanilla Soft not in the train. So if I drop out, you'll know why. Uh, but we're gonna have a lot of fun with this. Scott just prepared just an amazing lesson on lead qualification that every salesperson needs. Uh, I mean, this should be required reading and required watching for everybody who's out there. We're gonna be talking about working leads faster and booking more meetings and really getting to the point um, when you're driving inbound demand and inbound leads, it really becomes more of a question of being a, the guardian at the gate rather than if you're going outbound, you're trying to cater to the specifics and be the concierge, if you will. In this case, you're actually being the bouncer at the club instead of the concierge. I stole that from someone I can't credit. I can't remember who it was, but I love it. So um, my guest today, Scott Amerson, um, VP of Sales, with Vanilla Soft, and uh, he has done an awesome job with this lesson. Scott, you want to say hello to everybody? Hey, hello. Thanks for having me, Steve. Excellent. All right, we're we're I believe we're splashing a pole here, Sam. Right? Um, let's let and, and by the way, uh, make sure make sure that you tweet us. We skip that. You tweet us. We have the chat going here. We've got uh, call camp, as you know, is very very interactive. Uh, we we need to from you and to that end what percentage of your leads do you disqualify what percentage of your leads that your marketing organization produces for you do you disqualify now of course that's too simplistic a question i get it you might say well wait a minute how do you define a lead is a lead someone who requests uh, you know more information or a demo or a, or, a, or a, uh, a solutions presentation is a lead someone that just downloads a white paper is a lead someone we met at a trade show or just heck it's just a list of all the people who went to the trade show what is a lead just answer it however you think of it in your organization what percentage of your leads do you disqualify and walk away from anything to add on this scott yeah i i think you know the lead from our perspective is you know who are we talking to right whether it be the decision maker the influencer and in our case we're just looking to identify if we're going to add it to the pipeline then we believe we're speaking to the right person not only the right person but we have a solution that actually solves their problem that's the key all right let's close this poll and see what we got sam so interestingly enough we've got 30 percent saying 20 to 39 percent of their leads are dq'd and then another 30 say it's 40 to 59 percent in their organization and it looks like there's one or two outliers in there who say they DQ 80 to 99% of the leads they're getting. <laughs> we got to work on with that with the marketing team on kind of right in the fat middle in that kind of 30 to 60% range, which I, I, I think is what we expected. So thank you for voting there. All right. So moving on with the program here, we're going to be breaking down real calls today to understand how to work leads faster and book more uh, let's go ahead and get on with the lesson, shall we, Scott? Sure, let's just jump into it. So, a couple of things we'll talk about hey, today hey. is uh, let's go through a couple slides here before we jump into the calls. Um, patience and persistence, right? So, we, we, we often hear that um, when you start about from the sales perspective, patience, right? So, you know, how fast do you jump into the medium request? When someone gets you on the telephone or you've been fortunate enough to get a hold to someone and they say, yep, I'm interested in, and let's let's do a demo, let's do a discovery call. Well, you know, maybe we should take a step back, right? And just start thinking about, um, from my perspective, why are we getting on this call? So let's, let's you know, the, you know the, we hear it said so often, let's build rapport. Well, let's understand each other as to um, how can I add some value? As a as a salesperson, as representative, representative, and I'm cold calling Steve. How do I add some value to the conversation? Persistence, right? We all have to say pers persistent. Um, there's constant uh, stats out there that that say that you know eight to twelve attempts is the average attempts, but this can include phone attempts, right? It could be emails, video nowadays, LinkedIn voicemails. So how many how many attempts are we? as a sales organization, how many attempts are we making, right? What's the sales cadence look like from an outbound reach? And what's the combination of those cadences? It's just not 12 phone calls and you hang up, right? What's the message that goes along with the, the emails or the LinkedIn? Vidyard now has become a big part of our process here. 
We're including more personalized videos to include into the emails so that we can have more of a human touch. Validation, right? What's the validation for speaking with you? What, why am I taking my time as a prospect in this case to, to visit with you, right? There's a saying one of the guys have here is, you know, show them you know them, right? So understand what the role in their company is, right? If you're speaking to a VP of sales and SVP of sales, then you know, you're looking at potentially talking about the bottom of the funnel, understanding conversion rates, what are the conversations? Whereas if you're speaking to a CMO, you may be focused on the top of the funnel, more of MQLs and ROIs, right? He, he's trying to understand and validate, are the leads being called timely and consistently? And you need to be able to communicate some more commonly challenges each face, right? So you know, in this example for validation, the CMO, may not have the, the, the same concerns and challenges that the VP of sales. So when we start that homework, right, we're all doing this homework ahead of time, understand who you're talking to, and then be able to communicate that to them that you understand their pain points in that very 90 seconds or a minute of the conversation. Education, right, we all hear this, right? Buyers are self-educating. And oftentimes when you, when you get a response, from someone, if you're when you're when you're speaking to a prospect, and there's a question that comes up, or someone has a objection, right? That's a perfect time to ask a question. That's a perfect time to to ask them why. I think all too often as salespeople, we're afraid to ask why. Well, why do you do it that way? Well, if we don't know, we're not. If we don't ask, we won't know. And there's a, there's a great quote in the Challenger Sales Book that says, "Teach them what they don't know, but what they need to know." Right. And if you're successful in doing this from the start, I think you move you move from sitting across the table as a sales guy to maybe around the corner of the table as a trusted advisor. And when that happens, everything starts to change. And, and hey, Scott, this is Steve. I want to I want I want to add something here. Jeb Blount, by the way, is the show me, you know me. I believe Jeb can be you know, Jeb can be um, credited with show me, you know me. Um, and then I think the other interesting thing is the value of your time. The value of your time is so critically important in this. And if you're really going to be a trusted advisor, what that means is that it's also about not wasting your time. You know, you, you've, got to, you've got to value your own time as well. And that's, that's where you can have a productive, valuable conversation as peers. That's where, you know, the, the trusted advisor moniker starts actually coming to play. All right. So let's talk about engagement. Talk to us about uh, effective messaging. Yep. So effective messaging, right? So, uh, What's the PVC, right? What's, what's the, how do you personalize the message? Where's the value add and the call to action, right? So not just calling up and say, hey, Steve, Scott, you know, I'd like to get together and talk to you for 15 minutes, right? Who actually, who actually is gonna take 15 minutes to explain their, their process, right? It, it takes a lot longer. If I'm gonna do my job to, if I'm gonna do my job through discovery and show that I, I am a trusted advisor, then it's gonna take more than 15 minutes to have this conversation. But I gotta be able to personalize that, right? To continue the form of show me you know me by understanding how can I add value? And then the, the next step is where do we go forward from here and what are the next steps and what are the logical next steps in making sure that we secure the appointment for, for an introduction, not necessarily like, do you have five minutes for a discovery call? Well, no, I don't have five minutes for that. But do I have 30 minutes to understand what it is that you as a salesperson bring to the table and I'm willing to invest that time as a prospect? Yes. All right. Scripting. OK, we've we've all had this conversation. I hate scripting. People say I love it. And, and both sides can be right. But you can also look at. Dependent upon kind of I look at it in a couple of ways, right, dependent upon your sales cycle. So, so for example, we have SDRs, we have companies that have SDRs that are remote and they have high turnover. We recommend scripting to those guys for the simple fact, it's so much easier to bring someone up to speed, right? Have them come in, sit down, there's a script there. They can add their own personality to it, absolutely, but there's a framework that, that helps tremendously with onboarding, ramp, and consistency of messaging. Now I don't have someone saying God knows what and having any way to, to monitor it or in addition, report on it. 
right? There are some systems out there that allows you to create reporting on where did this, where did the deal go bad? At what part of the script did it, did the rep get to, right? So there could be opportunities to where you've got reps where they're, they're losing deals, but they're only going through the first three parts of the script, right? Other ways, if you say, you know, Scott, I hate the scripts. I don't want to read verbatim. Fantastic. There's other areas where you can utilize uh, branch lo logical scripting to where there's a guideline, right? Maybe it's priceless. Maybe there's competitor updates. Maybe it's the next steps in the appointment, right? In many cases, some of the customers may have four or five steps that they have to go through to set an appointment. So why not use that? Why not use that as that scripting spark? as a place to kind of walk them through what the next steps are. Hey, Scott. And what we're seeing, what we're seeing the best companies do is um, they have either battle cards and or bullet points. So the talking points are more, more written in the format of bullet points and it gives all the ability of having a guide without having the negatives of writing of a written paragraph. So avoid scripts as written paragraphs that will lead to robots that read, which is not what we're going for. It's not telemarketing here. At the same time, they need the guide, use bullet points, and use battle cards. Yeah, what fantastic. about lead by following? Yeah. So here we're talking about right uh, conversational analytics, right? The ability to listen and how do people react to questions, right? What? So when you're listening to calls, I love listening to, to, to our coaching calls to hear what's the back and forth ratio look like, right? How many meaningless statements are there? We have we have the ability to look at and key, enter in key phrases. Right. So I start list, listening for discount. Right. I start listening for our uh, competitor names. How many of those pop up in the conversation? I start listening for certain phrases that that help me advance the call forward. As well as understand where maybe it fell apart. In addition to that, we can look at how many words per minute are you speaking? Now, Steve, you may know this, but and I think this number could be correct. The humans can only comprehend around 108 to 125 words a minute. Does that sound accurate to you? That's right. And people end up speaking at 140 to 160. So that's yeah. Right. So if you're speaking at 160, then your message is just, just simply is getting lost, right? So you know, the key thing here is when we go through the, the lead by following part is the coaching aspect is more of you said this wrong or you said this right is going a little bit more granular and understanding where the conversation points are and where the transition takes place. Beautiful, let's move on. Yep. So productivity, right? Talk about productivity. Here we go. Time, prioritize, and automate. We Steve spoke about it earlier, right? Time's infinite resource. Can't be replaced, don't waste it right? Don't waste your time. And in many cases, I think salespeople find that to be very challenging because they, 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 they rationalize busy work as investment and it's not, right? They're simply, they're doing, they're doing tasks to stay busy instead of really understanding the value of their time, right? I mean, to, to a sales guy today, their, their sales clock can, can be open, you know, their business can be open 24 seven, right? The internet doesn't sleep, so they can still do their uh, they can still do their research after hours. They can still do uh, navigator contacts after hours. So the key part here is understanding how do I invest it with the best outcome. And I say invest invest it versus spend. I think there's a big difference. When I invest in something, I expect a return. When I'm spending it. You know what? It's just a transaction to me. Right. Prioritize. Right. A system that uses a queue to deliver the next best lead on lead management. It defines priorities, ensures your efforts are optional. Right. So what we're talking about here is how do we prioritize the people we're calling? Do we prioritize them using the list? Do we use a queue based system? Do we use a calendar? Are they because of the biggest deal in our pipeline? Is it because I can pronounce their names? Right. How do we prioritize? not only our time, but how do we prioritize the people that we're gonna contact? And then automation, right? So how many channels can we work on at once? Can we use LinkedIn? Can we use Zoom? Using Vidyard? Are we phone? Are we tweeting? So 
how do we take this mixture, right, of time, participation, automation, and then make it work for us so that we become more productive? Right? Beautiful. Okay. Let's go here. Technology, right? So I read recently that uh, tech stack today for SDRs can range between four and seven. That's what I've heard, right? And I can look at my internally and say, you know what, I'm not that far off. So marketing automation, right? They're top of funnel. They're looking for MQLs, inbound leads, demos, requests through Zoom and Discover Org, right? So they're trying to drive activity to the very top to give the SDRs, BDRs, et cetera, opportunity to go out uh, and do their prospecting, right? From a sales engagement plan point, right? We're, we view ourselves at the start of the relationship and we're working with, with various sales cadences and messaging. So whether that's using social, whether it being uh, LinkedIn, Navigator, et cetera, uh, texting, texting is now becoming a big part of many of our customers' businesses, right? So where do we fit in the beginning of the relationship? Um, you know, we look at CRM. So CR, you know, CRM is designed by, in our opinion, by tracking relationships, right? That's where it, that's where it, that's where the, the actual lead, uh, once it becomes a customer, resides from there on, right? Reporting, cross-departmental collaboration, campaign management. So in our situation, we find, as you see here, we sit right in the middle. We're more top of funnel. Hey, Scott, we've actually got a really awesome question from the audience. What ratio of calls to emails do you suggest for activity levels? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll give an answer beyond it depends but it, it it does depend. For example, we're dialing roofing companies now, right? So we found that it's that that needs to be email, email, email before call, right? Because we can't catch these guys. They, they, they have, they have an industry that's fantastic for our product and our solution, but through attending trade shows and research, we realize we can't get them on the phone first attempt. So, in that case, yeah, that's probably going to be a a a 60-40 split with email first. And we have a cadence built out, a uh, 15-day cadence that will, a 15-step cadence, I should say, that would be a combination of probably 6 6%, 60 percent of email and the other ones are voicemail and phone. So it, it, it depends on if, it, it just depends on what you're, what your strong suits are in some cases being able to you know pick up the phone and make the calls it sounds so simple but yet we find more and more customers wanting to get behind the the email train i like pick up and the hey phone. scott yeah scott this is steve so so the um what we're seeing in terms of uh of a a number of uh sequence cadence series whatever you want to call it is uh no more than two voicemails over a 30-day period um up to maybe seven to ten emails which seems a lot but again it depends on how heavily solicited the the person for you <clears throat> with with dials quite a few dials in between so the ratio of ultimate dials to um to emails is more of like a two to one or a three to one ratio when it's all said and done but the highest probability far and away that you have of getting them is day zero is the day that they first come in and very frequent very very early on into into when they come inbound if possible if you can catch them while they're shopping, while they're hot. If not, like he's saying before, you go into a different motion depending on the buyer. If the buyer is not on LinkedIn, don't spend any time on LinkedIn. If the buyer is a roofing contractor and they're on roofs and you can't talk to them on the phone, you're probably going to depend more on email or perhaps text when they're during a break and they can call you back or those kinds of things. So you really do have to run A-B tests to be able to answer the, this question effectively. Um, but those are just some guys also going to have the same follow-up for every one of your leads if it's an a versus the b versus the c and tip of the hat to john barrow as he talks about this you're going to have a different um flow for each of those with a different amount of touches with our c's we might not have anything at all you know following this webinar if, if the if the company's the right, not the right type of company in our ideal client profile we we might not call you at all none of the reps and our team will call you at all but if you're the right type of company we might not only call you but probably also identify who are the other stakeholders in the decision-making process. So it is a big depends, but you do have to have a mix, a healthy mix of the two. Let's, uh, let's keep going here. So Anum, Bant, Medic, and T-Man 
really these are different qualification frameworks that we're seeing people use. Everyone's probably got your favorite uh, four letter, usually sometimes more uh, acronym. Anna means authority, need, urgency, money. Uh, BANT, budget, authority, need, timing. TMAN, timing, money, authority, need. Uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Medic is about decision-making process, decision-making timeline. Medic is really more for opportunities. That's a force management term, force management, the, a selling methodology. The key here is that what we find is the patient's framework that they use. So coming out of this webinar, you should be thinking about what is our definition of a qualified lead? And when it's unqualified, um, you know, what, what do we do if, if it's an unqualified contact but it's a qualified account go find the right contact if it's an unqualified account don't market to it anymore you know don't sell to them anymore don't waste your time if you have other leads do not be the company that processes the leads like they're coming down a conveyor belt as i was just working with a customer of ours in new york and and we were talking about this exact thing don't be the assembly line all right so guys what slows you down when you're working leads you guys tell us type it into the, the chat what slows you down when you're working on your leads and I you know you could certainly say things like oh, our leads suck that's a common one we hear uh, Scott what do you hear when you're dealing with your customers with vanilla soft customers what are some things that are slowing them down in some cases it's uh, it's research right I mean the big push today is we talked about it earlier show me you know me but there's also a paralysis by analysis, right? To where I have to go through everything you've ever written. I, I look at the tweets. I look at who you follow. I look at your groups. You know, I could spend 45 minutes researching Steve, calling it a voicemail, right? And then it becomes that rinse and repeat over and over and over again to where at, at, at times, yes, you have to be prepared. But I think there's a level of that. So, you know, what slows you down in some cases is just getting prepared for the call. The other aspect of what slows people down is they, they, they don't have an agenda when they get someone on the phone, right? So it becomes kind of a tailspin of, I finally get you, but then I'm not prepared to, to speak to the pain points you may have. And then it just kind of starts to cycle. So it never really gets into a true cadence or a true pipeline. Sam, we got any comments coming in here? Otherwise, we are going to go listen to some calls. Yeah, actually, so we've got a few in here. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, one person shared that what slows them down is duplicates put in, but it's the same company. So duplicate contacts, I totally feel that one, uh, as well as research and old leads, so working old leads again, the after call work and rescheduling, people hiding behind their tech. Uh, lots and lots and lots of agreements on research. Ooh, and then somebody else who says that their biggest challenge is having to dial 400 plus dials just to find a qualified prospect on an outbound motion. That's a good one. Oh my yeah. goodness, man! Yeah, that's, that's yeah whoever tough. whoever that is, let, let me send me whoever that is. Seriously, send me an email. I'll probably help you. My email is Steve at executvision.io um, because. That means there's something in the machine. Scott and I heard the same thing that's, that's broken that can be addressed because uh, otherwise you're just banging your head against the wall and that's not a good use of time. Guys, in terms of research, we find there are three personas of research. One is the cowboys. They shoot from the hip, ask questions later. Lots of activity. The other one is the librarian. The librarians research a small number of accounts or contacts and they spend all day on them and, and they don't have the volume, but really the best persona we see is what we call sniper shooters. Do the research fast, do it once, make sure it's noted in whatever CRM or system you're using, and then use that information uh, on the actual call with the prospect to dramatically increase your conversion rates. Again, those are your sniper shooters. Tweet us at call camp. Sam, let's go to the calls. And Scott, you get to be John Gruden, huh? Fantastic. Love that. Get up to the whiteboard. All right. Okay. So we're going to kick off with Chase here if you want to intro this call. Okay. So uh, this call here, this is an inbound call that it came in for a demo request. Actually, it came through by email first in our system. So it came through basic information. They simply talked about, you know, they had some users 
so what we'll hear on this call is is a couple of things where Chase gets the gets the lead back on the phone and we start trying to qualify. Right. So in this case, you'll hear us go through some discovery. You'll hear us uh, try to understand their business process. Uh, we're trying to collect information, as we talked about earlier, to deselect. If we understand that we start hitting words like predictive dialing or true CRM, things that really don't fit our sweet spot, then we'll cut that off in the beginning instead of having, you know, an hour and a half meeting and, and additional discovery calls to realize, yeah, we're not the right fit or we haven't price qualified them either. So what we'll start with is just at the beginning, Sam, if we can kind of kick it off, you'll hear kind of the introduction. Um, and we'll we'll start to hear Chase ask some questions. Hello. Hi. Hey, my name is Chase Connor. I'm calling from Vanilla Soft. How are you today? Oh, good. How are you? Not too bad, thanks. Uh, just want to follow up with you. I saw that you were kind of looking for a demo request here. Um, just wanted to be your point of contact, see if you're still looking to see our solution and uh, learn a little bit more about your business and what you're trying to do. Is uh, now a good time to chat? Yeah, actually, now is the perfect time because uh, me and my team are moving pretty fast. So I'm trying to find the best system, uh, irregardless of the price, that would just be able to uh, be the best solution for the team. And from what I was looking at is that you guys offer the most. Oh, Sam, can you uh, stop that? Yep. Yep. So, so here, so we here we had the, the introduction, right? I'm not a big fan of how you're doing. I get it. Uh, but I've got a couple guys here who are pretty strong that can get that can get by the pivot from the prospect. Um, it's a coaching point I'm working with. I necessarily don't think that it adds value. We're certainly not building a rapport. But what we also found was we got Chase to understand. Uh, he started asking the questions as to what are we trying to accomplish today, right? So he's getting this guy talking. Now, I understand it's a lot different when someone calls inbound and they reached out to you. But still, you can lose control of the call really fast if you're not staying on point. So in the beginning, we said, hey, it's now a good time to talk. So we're now we're setting the stage for kind of what the next steps are. And from here, we'll hear the, the guy start to, he'll quite frankly just start rambling. Rather, he's looking for the best system. Uh, you'll hear him say he's looking for the best system regardless of price. Uh, and then he says he, that Vanilla Soft appears to be the lowest value. Not really what I was looking to hear for. Uh, and these things start to mount up. So I think you'll hear Chase really start to try to qualify this guy more and more about what he says. So let's click it again, Sam. Are you? Then compared to like any of the competition. So I was just wondering uh, that if I could get a demo just so I can see a little bit more about exactly what the product is so I can present it to uh, someone on my team who I need to to make sure I get approval for it because I'm trying not to pay for it. I'm trying to see if I can uh, get someone on the team to pay for it so everybody on the team can use this system that will that'll help us with our outbound. Yeah, so, so here's a guy who, who's identified himself as not having price and authority. Um, he's leading us to believe he's not even the decision maker, right? So he's, He's mentioned in the very beginning that he's looking for a system regardless of price. He's identified Vanilla Soft as being an opportunity, but yet he's saying that, that although price is no big deal, he wants a demo to see exactly what we can do. Now, he's been to our website, which doesn't mean he necessarily has identified all that we do, but he has an indication before he signed up. So what we're starting to see on play here is, is someone who we're really trying to understand where does he fit in in the sprocket at this point in time so what we have what we have not done is just said hey that's fantastic let's jump on a call and do a demo as could be the case in some in, in some cases where the sales rep just wants to get an activity right if it's driven by simply having the demo on the board then it could be very easy for someone to say fantastic let's jump on it and let's figure it out but those demos and discovery calls can take an hour, hour and a half. So we're trying to, at this point in time, filter through the, the conversation. Okay. Hey, Sam. Scott. And it's, yeah. it's, hey, Scott, it's Steve. Just to jump in on that, the, the, I, I learned this earlier in my sales career from, again, someone I can't remember. I love crediting people. They said the one who asked the question controls the conversation. And I think what you're hearing in the example of this buyer is a 
really good example of a confused, somewhat dysfunctional buyer. Buyers are irrational. They talk about this in another book called Challenger Customer, how buyers are irrational. They don't know how to buy and they get very frenetic. Sometimes it's like, we, we have a fire, we have to put it out right now. And then you back them up and they realize, actually, that's not our problem at all. So they, it, the, the one who wins when you're dealing with lead qualification, the company that understands the buyer's challenge or issue or opportunity, um, in Miller-Hyman, they describe it as what the buyer seeks to either fix, accomplish, or avoid. The company that understands that the best and helps the buyer understand that about themselves and build consensus around the problem, they're the one that wins. So again, really good resource for you is a book I've talked about in other call camps called Challenger Customer. It's the cousin of the Challenger sale. It helps you understand the dysfunctional buying committees that are out there right now. And this to me just smells like a perfect example of a dysfunctional buyer committee where you know this guy's calling with his hair on fire, but in reality, the consensus buying group probably doesn't even know what the problem is. They can't articulate it in a clear and effective way. So how, why would they go spend money? Why would their CFO ever approve an expenditure if they don't even know what the problem is as a group? You see well, what I mean? So this is where it becomes so important to ask the questions. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. And this is going to come out. You're, you're, you're spot on on this where he really doesn't know. You'll hear when Chase asks him, which is going to come up here the next second, where, where I say Chase pumps the brakes on the demo and starts asking some questions, some just simple questions like explaining what it is you guys do. What are some of the challenges you're facing? Uh, he's going to, you know, the prospects going to come forward. You'll hear in a second and start talking about growth plans that when you hear them, you just don't have any confidence that this is actually legit. So it is state of confusion at this point in time. Okay, Sam, let's roll some more. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I want to get to learn a little bit more about you, your business, what you guys are trying to do, because I could go in there and show it to you, but if you don't have like a, if I don't have a grasp of like what to show you and what's really going to resonate with you, uh, it, it doesn't really, really kind of stick. So how many people are on your team? Oh, right now there's about, okay, so we're having about, we have, we have several teams. We have one team for inbound because we just we have warm leads, which is around uh, six people right now, but it's going to be ten by tomorrow. Uh, we want an outbound team, which will be uh, finished by tomorrow, with, with about thirty people. So I'm looking on average with about fifty people. And what are you guys doing? I mean, what's the, what do you guys sell? And everyone selling something, but what do you guys? What, what's oh, the, have you ever have you ever heard of a? No, I haven't. Okay, do you know what? Um, so he's actually um best way I can say this is just he, he sells courses like he comes courses on oh, Amazon. Okay. So let's stop it there, Sam. So so you can see where we are already, right? We yeah. he's got some growth plans. Nothing leads me to believe so far that I believe this guy has a that a they're already in place or b they're going to be in place. I I just not convinced by how he articulates it. So yes, am I judging and profiling? Absolutely but that's part of what we do, right? So what's gonna happen in this next little stitch is he's gonna say, oh, we're gonna sell some courses, right? So that's gonna be kind of the, the grave of it. So basically what we have here is we have a we have an organization, independent contractors, and each one of these, organiz each one of these contractors are trying to sell a course for online, uh, is training, online training to sell a specific product, right? So that's what's gonna come up. Some of the questions that I didn't hear that I really wish we would have asked um, is to understand more about what the training costs are. Like, what does it cost to buy his training course? Right. In addition to, is it a subscription? Is it a one time? And what's the value of the leads to close rates? Right. And what and what's driving the what's the driving force behind your search now for a solution? And those things become evident when you hear the call that he really doesn't know. So. We're still two minutes into the request, and we haven't said yes. Let's jump on the call. And and here, hey, and hold on here. Why? Hey Scott, hold on here. Call campers, if you're if you're out there listening to this, this is one of those ones I would I would like write down and double underline. What's driving the request? What what you know? How many leads does it take to close something? In this case, what are those leads worth? What do you? What, how much are you selling them for? This is the sort of thing that less than 1% of salespeople on the planet do, 
And guess what? Those people are the six figure, in some cases, the seven figure salespeople is they can help the buyer understand the problem and what, why they're trying to do what they're doing in the first place. Good points. Yeah. Because we're trying to tie it into at the end, right? It, eventually, although he says price it in an op objective, price is an objective. We're going to hear this later. It's a big deal, right? So what Chase is, what he's trying to get to is when we get back to the pricing point, we're going to tie back in with these are the things you already told me that were important. And here's the, the financial impact or here's the loss. Here's the opportunity loss for the investment. So that, that'll come forward. But for the next little piece, go ahead and hit it, Sam, and we'll kind of hear how they go through the uh, explanation. That makes sense. So, so you're going and, and, and hoping to sell some of these courses? Yeah, we're selling them right now for inbound, and I'm, we're looking to approach the outbound game. So I'm trying to find the best system that will help us for in the next so 30 to 60 days when, like, our growth is just extraordinary with a uh, recent launch we're about to be doing. So I want to make sure that we can handle the volume. And not, and not only that, I don't want to – we're growing, so I want to be able to grow with the company. I don't want to – be out. I don't want to use something that's outdated, like just like using like something uh, like a free recording app or something. I want it to all be just in a central spot, even if it's paid for. That way, it's just all in there and it's easier on everybody. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we're gonna to have to do it down the road anyway. Yeah, so it's gonna scale with your business, uh, and then also provide you with a consi consistent innovation that's gonna kind of you stop there for a second, Sam. Forward. So, so here's one of the things I picked up on listening to this call. This guy used I a lot, right? He, he used I want this, I need this, I, I, I. And so far up to this point, three minutes in, we've established that he's not the, he's not the influencer or the decision maker at this point in time. Because he keeps saying, I want other people to pay for it. He says money's not an object, but yet he keeps giving demands. So what Chase is now having to do is to understand, I've got someone here on the line I really need to get to the next level, right? I've got to use this information and package it up to the next level call and be able to continue to continue communicating. I understand some of your pain points and your working challenges, but but this guy's not demonstrating that he's actually that guy, right? It's it, it's just it's not very communicative from his point. Chase is having to pull information out that I don't think we really have a good foundation as to where does it go? Hey, hey Scott, I've got to jump in here because another lesson from Challenger customer is they talk about turning the I into the we. When someone's saying I, 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 that usually means that it's like their personal crusader initiative as opposed to being a larger group initiative or business initiative. So the pronoun matters a lot. You've got to find out who else is involved in that, who else it impacts, who else it affects, um, who else would feel left out if they weren't involved or besides you, who else are the decision makers? Because we gotta understand what that buying group looks like. And right now, that the lack of the pronoun we makes me very concerned. Um, the reason I'm concerned is because a lot of times buyers, when they come inbound like this guy, someone else has been shaping his buying vision. And the company that shapes the buying vision, to quote my old friend Craig Elias there, they win 70% of the time. So if somebody else, if another vendor has been shaping the buying vision and this guy is coming in like, I need information, I, 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 I need information, it very well might be that you guys are in column C on the spreadsheet and you're, as they say, column fodder, not cannon fodder, but column fodder, meaning you're going to provide all this information and he, he says jump, you say how high, and waste a lot of your time, but in reality, you're pitching dead. They've already made a decision to go with someone else, and they're just covering their, their ass by having, uh, you know, they made the right decision. Yeah, this is a validation cell, right? They're just looking to validate the decision they've already made by doing the due diligence uh, of looking at a third party. You know, in, in this case, we, and, and we're behind that. We, we know what's behind the curtain now. So in this case, that's not the case. But we're certainly looking at um, we're certainly looking at where's the who makes the decision. That's really what we're trying to get to. So let's roll some more. And that's this is why I kind of wanted to have this discussion. Um, 
So when you guys are having these conversations, you know, what type of information are you gathering? What does that cycle look like? Do you mind walking me through this? Sure. Uh, it varies. Uh, personally, for me, my closing style, I'm very uh, quick and to the point, and that's exactly the same way I teach everybody. For inbounds, it's uh, how we have it set up. Our leads are so warm with the qualification process that all we have to ask them is exactly like, why why now? Why this opportunity? Why this course? And by the time we ask them that, they're so warmed up after all the questions we've asked them with the questionnaire and calling them previously that they're already ready to buy. So inbound, it's it's a lot easier. With outbound, we have two outbound systems. We have one system where we call everybody who doesn't watch the webinar. Uh-huh. Whoever doesn't watch the webinar, we call every single person. At least that's what we're going to be doing. And then we have another one where if people go to the checkout page but they don't buy after watching the webinar, we go ahead and give them a call also because we can track on their end and that's how we call them and we're like, hey, so what was wrong because we're trying to check out and you didn't check out, so what can we do? That's how we approach both of our outbounds and then we have another system where we do follow-up calls where we just call everybody who's bought the course to make sure that that they're doing well and then we're also expanding it. This is just a continuation of uh, this guy going through nothing specific, right? Still, still doesn't does, doesn't convince me that he really understands his uh, sales cycle, uh, understand what his approach may be. Um, kind of as a as we, you know, even though this comes as an inbound call, once we get past the pleasantries, the discovery questions become very similar as they would be on an outbound, providing I already kind of know something about you, right? So, as, as We'll move on to the other call in respect of time. Quickly, how this ends: uh, we have a we we do another price qualification call. Uh, price does matter. We realize who the who the actual buyers are. Uh, we've had conversation with those guys. We've price qualified them. In our case, it's really simple. Our pricing is on our website, so we just direct them there and say this is where we start. Uh, these guys are in trial now, so we're we're moving toward a converting a legit opportunity. It, but we just had to use this guy as a as an invite into actual who the influences are. Steve, anything to add before we go to the uh, the other call? Go to the second call. I love the lesson. Fantastic. Okay, so second call here, uh, Davis Arnold outbound call. Uh, Davis is an SDR. He's calling for he's calling for someone. Um, He's actually, he's identified through research who the buyer is. He's identified that the VP, uh, actually the director inside sales is the influencer. Um, he's not been able to connect with this person. Uh, he's tried LinkedIn, Navigator, sent an email, video. So what he's done is by using Navigator, he's identified someone else in the group. And although he knows this person is really not the buyer, the intent here is to can he extract some information that he can use when he speaks to um, who we believe to be the, the, the decision maker? And, and he was able to accomplish that just by kind of hanging on. It's like that one more question guy, right? I got one more question for you. I got one more question for you. So let's cue it up with this one and uh, we'll see how it starts out. Hey, good morning. Davis Ola with the Noah Software. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Hey, not too shabby. We're grinding here in Dallas. Um, hey, actually, we're just giving you a shout. Uh, I was actually originally trying to get in touch with you, um, but I saw that you were heading up business development, so I um, thought you may be able to lend in here to this. Um, but anyway, I was calling because I saw that a lot of these AEs were taking, uh, looks like 100 plus cold calls a day from what looks like directly out of Salesforce. Um, and when you've got folks making that high of outreach there, um, you risk your best needs going stale from cherry picking and accidental neglect. So you have to know uh, We actually have a way to get those prioritized for you and make sure that they're worked consistently. Um, and I actually also saw last piece of this, put on my detective hat, that someone is checking out sales and engagement reviews uh, on G2's website. Um, so again, just quick sure. about maybe Checking out sales engagement reviews. Uh, so, oh, stop there, Sam. Um, so, yep. So, so introduction part, right? Uh, once again, not a huge fan of the uh, of the how you're doing. It's a bad habit to break. But again, Davis has a pretty strong personality. Um, he tells him the purpose of my call. 
right? Tells him why we're calling. Uh, he's done his research. He's identified that, hey, I see that you guys are making 100 plus sales calls a day uh, that you're using Salesforce. Now, my guess is with Davis, he knows that because he's been to their website and he's looked at their job descriptions. He's looked at people that they're hiring and he's gleaned that they have Salesforce and that they have a they have a threshold. So this is one of my guys who does just excessive research. But you'll hear here he's he's identified it. He shared it with this individual. Uh, he's also included a little bit about what we do. And what I like about this call is he hasn't product dumped. He's used Vanillasoft's name once, right? But he hasn't gone through a list of of features at this point in time. The only thing he's mentioned that's unique to Vanellisoft is the queue. But he's also, he's done his detective work and he says so, right? He's, uh, we've also identified that these guys were on G2 buyer intent checking us out. So in the first 25 seconds, uh, when the first minute I should say, he's identified himself, he's told him why he's called, he's identified or communicated uh, a little bit about how they're per they're currently utilizing in the system, right? 100 calls, Salesforce. He'll come back to that a little bit later. And he's talked a little bit about how we help. So that's I can't what emphasize how good this call is, Scott. I mean, the way he does that in a nice compact package, you wouldn't believe how many people do research and they never say it. And this is another one of those ones where it just makes me scratch my head like, if you go and find out by looking at job descriptions that they use Salesforce and they make over 100 calls a day, tell them. Tell them you know it. And there's a lot of brain science behind that. We'll save for a future call camp, but this beautifully done. And I love the detective hat thing. Excellent. Fantastic. Let's roll, Sam. It may have been jumping to conclusions there. But was looking for, I thought she would be best one of context, but she saw that she uh, oversaw sales in me. Um, and that you oversaw business development, and we're just looking to um, pick up a conversation here for the next few weeks. Is this layer on top of Salesforce, or is it, what is it? Layers on top of Salesforce, yes, sir. So it would be used for the AEs primarily, and the whole purpose being, you know, it keeps their cold calls organized. Once that lead is qualified and ready for, you know, a demo, the pitch, the presentation, then it moves directly uh, into Salesforce. So let's stop there for a second, Sam. So, so we're a minute 27 in the call. The prospect gets the first question, right? And it's a qualifying question that, you know, in, in some cases, you know, the rep could simply answer, yes, it sits on the top of an L a Salesforce. So Davis answered the question and then provided information that this guy didn't ask for, right? He, he told him not only, yes, it does, but how it works. Right. So now he's starting to he's starting to educate the guy unintent well intentionally from Davis's perspective as to how we help in that situation. How do we fit? Right. And what you'll hear next is, which I think is music to a salesperson's ears, the guy's gonna say, Tell me more. So let's roll anything else on Steve. You're nailing it. Let's do it. Uh, All right. So, so uh, tell me a little bit about it. Yeah, sure thing. So we are considered a sales engagement tool uh, that's queue-based, meaning that when your AE logs in to make the cold calls, they're only seeing one lead at a time. So instead of picking out of the 100, uh, which we see that 40% you know, of leads never even get contacted on the first time, and I think it's, uh, what, 25% get a second call, this is going to take out the decision-making of, hey, who should I call next and when should I follow up? It'll just tee up. One of the time, based on an order that you or decide is, hey, this is the best contact you have available. Um, so when you've got high volume cold calling, lead qualification, just keep some focus, and then actually end result, you know, you end up working these leads, you know, eight to twelve touches, uh, which is typically the industry standard in order it takes to get a hold of somebody. Uh, instead of letting it just fall off and you know live somewhere else uh, within a CRM and never to be contacted again. So let's stop it there, Sam. Qualify the leads. So, so here we go. We just went through a little bit more discovery, right? So again, you know, the guy asked to tell me more. So I, I think Davis did a very good job of explaining what it is we do, while also talking to potential pain points of having AEs go through a list-based calling 
what some of the challenges are with those guys. Right? The eight to 12 touches, the you know the 20 percent after those are those are very widely known statistics that salespeople um, that fail to do for reach up for reach out right. We're in most time we're reaching out just three times versus the eight to 12. So what he's trying to do here is just communicate without selling. And it's the thing I really like about this call is Davis is having a conversation, an exchange of information that's yet to feel like he's being he's being sold. Right. We're, we're just trying to collect information to see are we a fit? We go back to that pre-selecting. So in this case, I think he's done a nice job of, of getting our point across. Um, and kind of understanding more about what it is that we do. Without it being hurry up to the next step, right? We're not forcing we're not forcing the call to a step that's not necessary at this point in time. Steve, any okay, everyone, on? focus focus on the topic. Don't focus on the solution or the features or the benefits. So focus on the topic, and the topic could be pain points, but the topic could also be just the topic. It's something that they'd like to have an opportunity to do better at in the future or a risk they'd like to avoid. But again, focus on the topic or the trend that's going on in the, in the industry. You know, we're seeing a big trend around um, leads not being followed up on appropriately and marketers wasting a lot of money. That's a, that's a trend. It's really a trend and a topic that we can speak to. So we're not, we're not giving them the pill yet. Instead, we're just understanding the symptoms. So, Steve, what I'm going to do here, since we're up against the clock and when I have time for q and I'll recap really quickly, right? The, you know, the next block was the guy says, send me some information, right, which is the dreaded, the, the dreaded part, right? So, what do you want me to send you? What, what, what would I send you that would, um, that, would, that would validate who I am and push me through the next decision maker? But what came out of the call was, as you can see at the bottom, is uh, the guy offers up, I'm not the right guy. We kind of knew that already, but now we know that he's a he's not the point of contact. So our future communications is going to be toward um, uh, Jamie as a person who spoke. But he also gave us the he also gave his name as a VP. Uh, he also started to unravel some of the tech stack that they're currently using and some of the challenges with data. So we got a lot of information out of the call that's uh, that's led to you know, a follow-up call with the right party of contact, but with a lot more information. So now when we call back to uh, to Jamie, we, we can say what we've heard, not what we think. And we can preface it by saying, we spoke to your colleague. And that's gonna buy us what I say, 90 seconds longer on the telephone. Yeah, guys, use the leads as clues for where the opportunity might be. Use, use a, a more junior person as a springboard to get to the more senior person. And then when, when you deal with more senior folks, uh, VP, C-level, et cetera, their expectation will be that you already understand their business and that you'll be able to tell them something that they don't know about their business. So, so you, getting this information from a more junior person and leveraging it to springboard to the right person of where there might be an opportunity is the best practice. It, you could think of it in football terms as you're getting first down. You know, you're not you're not getting the appointment yet, but that's that's fine because when you get the appointment, it's going to be a much much better appointment. So we're getting first downs on the way to getting our our touchdown. All right, so let's let's summarize the whole thing here. Stan, you want to go back to the slides and let's also see what what comments and questions came in because I see that little thing flashing over on my side. Uh, Scott, why don't you recap it first here what we've learned, and then we'll do some Q and A. So we talked about patience, right? Uh, and I think today we saw an illustration of that. Let's be patient and understanding uh, specifically through the communication process, uh, understanding um, kind of what, what's the end goal here, right? Not only for us, but also for the client. And I, and yes, I talked about earlier, prioritize your time and yes, we have to, but we have to put the prospect first understanding what is it they're trying to get out of it and can we assist them, right? Validation, hey, are we telling the prospect, are we communicating clearly so that they understand why are they listening to us? Like, what's our value prop? What problems do we solve? And have we brought to light problems that they don't even know they should have? Uh, lead by following, right? We talked about that. Listen, then talk. Uh, you can't see it here, but in both of these cases, um, I think my guys were probably over 50% uh, on the talking point. 
uh, they could get more, they could get better questions in. Um, but in this case, you know, it's important to listen to what's being said and then inject what the what the answer is, but also be able to provide that extra value that says, okay, this guy actually really knows what he's talking about. He's helping me solve the problem, not just create it, right? Prioritize, how do you prioritize your leads? How do you prioritize your time? How do you prioritize what your cadence is when you're reaching out to these leads based on the different buckets that they may be in? And then automate, right? There has to be an automation to this. It's just no way you can do this on a day in, day out basis. Be effective without having a, an automation system. Scott, brilliantly done, Sam. What do we got for comments and questions? Sorry, I was muted. Look at me go. Um, one thing that popped up time and time again is what happens, and we heard it on Davis's call when they won't give up their boss. At what point is it acceptable to go over their head and go directly to their boss? On the next call. I mean, Davis already knew who they were, right? With Navigator now, it's almost impossible not to know who all the players are, right? If it's if it's legitimate company, and if if one or two people are on LinkedIn, then you can find out who they are. And, and that and that message not necessarily going over their head. It's say, hey, I spoke with, and he suggested I contact you, right? Or I spoke with Steve, and he recommended that uh, you know I follow up with you. He gave me some points of interest that may be of of um, of context, so it's it's qualifying. We're just trying to qualify: is Steve really the decision maker, or should I be talking to Sam? And if I have to go to Sam to get that, then I will. And and quite frankly, from my perspective, I I'm willing to accept that risk, which may be Sam. I mean, Steve coming back and saying, "I'm not doing business with you." It just means not doing business with me today. But that's my take. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, I, we share we share that same take. Sam, what other questions we got here? Let me see what else popped up. So what would you do in an instance, and Steve, you can probably nail this question, if you can't find somebody's direct line and you've just got a 1-800 number and this is an inbound lead, would you do this, like, would you just pass on them or do you still try and figure out who they are, how to get a hold of them, and then hit them with your phone cadence? Great question. Um, we just had one of these today. I was working with one of our customers up in New York, um, and they had an inbound lead, and they were asking my advice on this, and it was the, the main switchboard number. All we did was call at the receptionist and say, call in to verify the spelling of the name for Sam Nero. What's your extension number? 4327. How do you dial that directly? And they told us. So you can call in to get the, the, the number. You can use a tool like a Zoom Info or Discover Org. Um, and there's a free website called truepeoplesearch.com. Talk about real tricks of the trade, real secrets that are out there. It's completely free. That gives a lot of people cell phone numbers, shockingly a large number, as well as there are even voicemail codes. Uh, so if you hear your call is being answered by Audix, you can punch in star, star six, many other secrets like that. So yes, the answer is the research shows very, very clearly if you have someone's direct line you're much more likely to get the appointment than if you don't have their direct line. Um, in fact, you're, uh, you're, you're almost 60% uh, uh, more likely to get the appointment if you have the direct line. So get the direct line, even if they don't provide it on the form. You can actually call into the office and ask Steve, do you, I was trying to catch up with, uh, with Sam, do you have a direct line? Or, hey, I made a mistake, I was looking for Sam. What can, what can you say? No, I'm not gonna give it to you. And there is and Scott, there are so many ways to do this. And I'm, I say it's a shame on salespeople that just, you know, process the leads. Like you are not working in, in a factory assembly line where leads come after you and you just use your brain. Don't just be the person that like call the number, whatever number I was provided. And I always crack me up when people say incorrect information. That lead is still valuable. Get the correct information and then actually call and talk to the person. It's not that hard these days. All right, Sam, anything else? Otherwise, let's talk about our quick call to actions here. Guys, I really recommend you check out Vanilla Soft for this process of, of handling your leads more effectively, getting more out of your leads. Lots and lots of people are wasting lots of sales opportunities, so check out their guide, the science behind cold calling, and you can listen to it there. 
on that bit.ly. And I want to again thank Scott for doing such a great job with this lesson today. Sam, what are we doing for a call to action for us today? So today for us, go check out execvision.io slash resources. We've got some white papers up there, some awesome blogs. For those of you asking about going above somebody's head to their boss, there's a blog on there called Ask Steve, where he actually broke this down for a rep who emailed him and gave him some awesome tips. So I highly recommend you go read that one. Everyone, do more with your leads. We have to do more with our, with our leads. We're not optimized. Final thoughts, Scott? Yep. Uh, learn how to prioritize your time. It's valuable. It's the only thing that you can control on a daily basis. Amen. Amen to that. Your time is really the only thing, the only commodity that any of us have in this life is time. So, all right, everyone, thank you for listening. What are we doing next time, Sam? Do we have a call camp next time? So next month, the topic is yet to be decided, but it's going to be a really exciting one based on who we're working with. Oh, we got a mystery topic. Easy. All right, everyone, tune and in then. Easy. Looking forward to it. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.